Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Michael Malim, and uh, on behalf of King's Health Partners and King's College London, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's Rosalind Franklin Lecture, the second lecture of this year's King's International Lecture Series. Uh, before proceeding with the main uh, business of the evening, I'll provide you with a little bit of context to this lecture series. Uh, it celebrates our Academic Health Sciences Centre, which is called King's Health Partners, which was first designated by the Department of Health in uh, 2009 and was recently re-accredited for a further five years. This partnership is the practical and philosophical integration of King's College London with three South London NHS Foundation Trusts, Guy's and St Thomas's, King's College Hospital and the South London and Maudsley. And the chief aspiration of the uh, AHSC then is to deliver the, on the tripartite mission of excellence and innovation in research, education and clinical care, locally as well as globally. As part of King's Health Partners, the King's Bioscience Institute works to promote and support multidisciplinary research and postgraduate training across our entire uh, clinical and non-clinical staff and faculty, thereby aiming to promote the integration of very basic discovery-led science uh, with more applied translational and clinical research. One of the great uh, privileges of, uh, of the Institute is to host our Rosalind Franklin lectures, which celebrate the central importance of fundamental research to understanding and improving human health. As you will know, these are named in recognition of the life and achievements of the King's scientist, Rosalind Franklin. Dr. Franklin, a, a biophysicist and crystallographer, is, uh, in my view, one of the true greats of biological research. She is best known uh, for her groundbreaking structural studies on DNA, which led to the elucidation of the DNA double helix. Uh, the enduring impact of her work continues to resonate around us every day, with one illustration being the growth of personalized medicine based on genome sequencing of patients. We're very fortunate in this series to have heard from, from some outstanding scientists in the past. Uh, most recently, uh, Michael Sheets, who discussed his work on mechanosensing and the microenvironmental control of cell growth, death, and differentiation. In previous years, some of our speakers have included luminaries such as Roger Chen, who described his pioneering work on uh, exploitation of fluorescent proteins as guides for surgery. Beatrice Hahn, who described the ape origins of AIDS and malaria, and Susan Lindquist, who described her work on yeast as a model to understand neurodegeneration. Tonight, we are here to find out more about the research of Professor Sir Adrian Bird from the University of Edinburgh. Adrian is a particularly fitting speaker for this series because, as you will hear, his groundbreaking work has and continues to focus on a widespread modification to the normal chemistry of DNA, uh, methylation, and how the presence or absence of this modification impacts the organization and function of the genome. On top of this, Rosalind Franklin's great niece, Rebecca, is currently undertaking her PhD thesis research in Adrian's lab. It is also a great pleasure to welcome members of Rosalind Franklin's family here tonight, Rosalind's sister, Jennifer Glynn, and her husband, Ian, and we thank them immensely for their support of this series. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand you over to our host for this evening, Professor Rebecca Oakey from the Division of Genetics and Molecular Medicine, who will introduce uh, our speaker. Rebecca herself is an expert in the area of epigenetics, a field that owes much to Adrian's work. Rebecca, over to you, and thank you for organizing tonight's lecture. So uh, just to uh, have a, a bit of preamble about Adrian himself, Adrian read biochemistry at the University of Sussex before moving to Edinburgh to do his PhD. His postdoctoral training took him to both Yale and Zurich, and in 1975, Adrian returned to Edinburgh to the Mammalian Genetics Unit as a group leader. He then spent a few years in Vienna at the Institute for Molecular Pathology before once again returning to Edinburgh, but this time as the Buchanan Pro uh, Chair of Genetics, and in 1999, Adrian was made the director of the Wellcome Trust for uh, Center for Cell Biology. Adrian has received many honors, and including uh, during his career, including his election to the Royal Society in 1989. He won the Gairdner International Award 
in the 2011 and uh, was, on, was knighted in the 2014 honours list. I first met Adrian back in uh, 1988 on a Greek island. Um, it was called Spetsy, still is called Spetsy, where he was teaching on an EMBO summer school uh, on molecular biology. And it was the type of summer school where the tutorials took place in the sea, and if you were lucky, or on the beach. And I have to say, the fundamental principles of molecular biology were certainly well uh, learned, because I can still remember them. If you do a PubMed search on Adrian, you can see the words DNA methylation appearing in the titles of his papers since the 1970s. In the era of this summer school, Adrian published a cell paper describing a fraction of the genome that is derived from non-methylated CP-rich DNA known as HEPA2 tiny fragments, or HTF islands, which are now known as CPG islands. Perhaps one of my favorite manuscripts that he published around this time was from the journal, in the journal Nature, was the use of restriction enzymes to detect potential gene sequences in mammalian DNA, which describes exactly that, the use of rare cutting restriction enzymes in the identification of CPG islands and in turn their association with genes. A graduate student today in genetics checks the genome browser, clicks away and um, can find the sequence of practically any gene across many model species just with the click of a mouse. This illustrates how far we've come since the 1980s and the seminal contributions Adrian has made to our current understanding about the presence as well as the absence of DNA methylation in genome structure and function is truly humbling. Rigor and attention to biochemical detail has perfused Adrian's work throughout his career during which he's uncovered links between chromatin state and transcriptional activity. He identified and characterized methyl binding proteins and studied hum the human disease Rett syndrome, amongst many other findings. My personal favorite recently being his identification of uh, intragenic CPG islands and cryptic promoters, again drawing on his strength as a biochemist to, uh, uh, to um, draw from his uh, repertoire. So Adrian, thank you very much for coming here today. And without further ado, we'll hear your, your Rosalind Franklin seminar. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me to give this uh, prestigious lecture. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have some slides, uh, yeah, at some point. There we go, thanks. So um, my title is uh, CPG as a genomic signaling mole uh, molecule in health and disease. Uh, and I'm going to start off with a sort of uh, general introduction. The, the specificity of gene expression is primarily due to sequence-specific transcription factors. They're the proteins that can tell one bit of the genome from another and uh, can focus uh, activity there. Transcription factor recognition sequences in, in E. coli are usually 15 to 35 base pairs <coughs> long. Interestingly, all the transcription factors in E. coli have not yet been identified. But they're quite long, and it has a, a genome of about 4.6 megabases. Oddly, uh, you would, uh, in mammals, uh, they're only uh, six to eight base pairs long, on average, transcription factors. And, act and the problem that uh, uh, specif of, of uh, specifically finding certain regions of the genome is clearly much larger in mammals than it is in E. coli, because it has a genome of this size. So. Um, uh, how then do short transcription factors manage to conspire to find the right genes to activate? Well, the assumption is, and there is evidence to support this, that uh, the missing specificity uh, uh, caused by the short recognition, short and often very redundant recognition sequences of mammalian transcription factors comes from combinatorial binding. So in other words, you don't just bind one to activate the gene, but they must bind multiply, and therefore you multiply um, this, you get a multiple of the specificity. 
and also chromatin marking, which means some regions are qualified to interact and other regions are disqualified. So what I'm going to talk about here is uh, uh, an answer to this question. Do transcription factors, recognizing a two-base pair sequence uh, DNA motif, have enough specificity, specificity to be biologically functional? And obviously, from the title of my talk, where I've to, uh, I, I'm talking about C followed by G. Because it, a priori, you would expect that that's much too short to be useful. Obviously, one base pair is too short to be useful. Uh, because it would occur every four, three or four or two or three base pairs. But two doesn't sound as though it's an awful lot better. So I'm going to try, uh, well, I'm going to convince you, I hope, that uh, uh, two base pair sequences are uh, uh, useful uh, and uh, uh, can, be, can uh, be used to uh, convey information. So the features that, ad that adapt this CG sequence for genomic signaling uh, are, are several. So, um, firstly, let me point out it's a self-complementary sequence because the DNA strands are anti-parallel, CG is paired with itself, and uh, this sequence exists in multiple chemical forms. It can be unmethylated as here, it can be methylated on the cytosine uh, base, and that cytosine uh, methylation can be oxidized to form hydroxymethyl. There are actually another couple of oxidized forms also. Um, but they're, uh, again, derived from this sort of parent modification, which is methylation. So that's one piece of evidence that it looks as though it's conveying uh, some information. The second uh, point is that there are specific proteins that are attracted to or repelled by modif uh, modified forms. So there are proteins that interact with this, but not this. Uh, I'm going to mention this later on. Um, uh, and there are proteins that bind to this, but not this. This is much rarer, uh, and, uh, but is an area of intense interest. And the third feature is that it's highly variable in sequence, and this is due to the fact that methyl, methyl C is, is quite mutable. You can imagine the, the, the advantages of having a, um, a mark that you can apply to your very large genome that will adapt certain regions of it to certain functions. Uh, but unfortunately, DNA, you can't do much to it chemically without altering its, uh, it, its, its structure. And methylation of cytosine uh, in, is the, one of the few things you can do that is not disastrous uh, for function, but um, uh, it has a downside, and that is once you methylate cytosine, when you deaminate it, you get thymine. Whereas if you deaminate cytosine in the unmodified form, you get uracil. Uracil is a strange base. There's a machine for whipping it out. If you deaminate uh, methyl cytosine, you get thymine, which is not a strange base. It's a perfectly normal base, so it quite often escapes um, uh, the repair mechanism uh, and uh, leads to uh, a depletion of CPG. So if I represent CGs by, C by lollipops uh, and uh, the black ones are methylated and the white ones are unmethylated, in the bulk of the genome, which is about 99%, you see this low frequency. It's actually lower than you would expect if you calculate how much you should have. And that's because of this attrition due to uh, mutation. It's constantly mutating away, and you're creating new ones accidentally, uh, and, and this leads to a steady state. So in addition to that, which is the bulk genome, mostly methylated, um, you get CPG islands which are clusters where the frequency of CPG is 10 times higher than it is outside, and they're uh, nearly always non-methylated. So this again suggests that there's some kind of pattern here that contains information. So uh, I, I will mention that if, if non-methylated CPG ions sit over the promoters of genes very often, and uh, in fact, uh, if one of them gets methylated, as I'm going to now do with, with this one, I suddenly methylate it, um, uh, as happens uh, 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 fairly rarely, but certainly does happen during development. It happens on the inactive X chromosome, it happens at imprinted genes, uh, it happens at germline-specific genes, and when that happens, those genes are shut down. It also happens in cancer um, in an unscheduled way. So uh, methylation, dense methylation like this over the promoter of a gene shuts down the gene. So that's a, a functional consequence of DNA methylation. Low-density methylation doesn't have much effect. So I'm going to um, 
talk about specific proteins that are attracted or repelled by modified forms of CG. And in the first part of the talk, I'm going to say something about ones that bind unmodified forms, and particularly in relation to CPG islands, where lots of unmodified CG occur. And in the second part, I'll talk about a protein that binds to methylated, uh, namely this. So um, a question that has been around for a while is, what is the functional significance of CPG islands? Yes, they're over the promoters of genes. Yes, they're normally non-methylated. And if they get methylated, the gene comes to a grinding halt. But uh, what, it, what is the good of them when they're not methylated? Uh, so we um, devised a biochemical method of mapping CPG islands. And it's a sequencing method. So you end up with these little peaks of sequence. And what you can see is just a region of the, of, uh, of the uh, uh, human genome where you see um, CPG islands at the promoters of all the genes. The ones above the line are going left to right. The ones below are going right to left. So the uh, question you could ask is, well, what else goes with CPG islands? Is there anything else about them other than they sit over the promoters of genes? Well, uh, perhaps uh, not uh, entirely coincidentally, uh, you get RNA polymerase, the initiator form of RNA polymerase that sits over these CPG islands. You also get a, a modification of a histone. So DNA is wrapped in the histones. Uh, and uh, these histones, uh, one of their functions is to package the DNA, but another function is to carry elaborate marking. And the marking compared to DNA, where you just get methylation or no methylation, is very elaborate indeed. There are uh, many tens of modifications on the tails of histones whose meaning we are beginning to unravel, but actually um, we, 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 we don't, still don't know all that much. This one, however, is associated with ge active gene expression. And you find it very closely associated with um, um, CPG islands. Actually, I, what I said was wrong. It's associated with potentially active promoters. Even if they're inactive, it's also there. So we were interested in a protein uh, that binds to non-methylated CG. And as you might expect, it uh, binds to these sequences as a possible interpreter of the function of the CPG islands. Now, this is called CFP1. It's a CPG binding component of a complex that uh, binds at, at CPG islands. And the important thing about this complex is that it's a histone H3K4 methyltransferase. So um, it's a, it, the CXXC protein, therefore, potentially binds to CG, brings in this enzyme. And what that enzyme do, does is make this mark. And that's it. That's the lysine 4 of histone H3. It's on the tails of the, uh, of the nucleosome, uh, of the um, um, histone components of the nucleosome. I've drawn them freehand here. They're, nobody knows where they are because they're rather unstructured. This is the real structure, uh, but uh, these are imaginary. And there's H3K4. So uh, having seen that, the, the possibility was that proteins that bind to non-methylated CG are actually the interpreters of CPG island function. And indeed, if you knock out CFP1, a lot of the methylation in somatic cells particularly goes down to, through the floor. That says that that's, that's right. But a better experiment to find out if the CPG binding is, is important is to actually insert a piece of DNA. So we insert an artificial piece of DNA into uh, the um, Genome. In fact, this was in a, in a gene, and it's the GFP gene next to the bacterial puramycin resistance gene. And you see, this is the CPG frequency before you put it in. Then this is the bit you put in with lots of CPGs over about 1 kb, just a bit more. Um, and then it goes down again. So we've basically put a piece of junk into the genome. This is what it does to the CG frequency. It gives you a peak. And now if you ask where CFP1 is, you've, you've got a peak of CFP1. And what about H3K4 trimethylation, that, that uh, histone mark on the tail? And there it is, too. Is, have we accidentally made a gene? Uh, no, we have not. There's no promoter in that uh, structure. And this is RNA polymerase. There's no RNA polymerase there. So the conclusion of this experiment, uh, which was um, done a few years ago, uh, it was the presence of non-methylated CG influences chromatin structure via the CFP1 set 1 complex. There are other CG binding proteins. They also have this CXXC domain, which is a zinc finger domain that binds to non-methylated CG. And that this, this could be a key function of CPG ions, to set up appropriate structure 
chromatin structures and genes. So here are some of the other proteins in the CXXC family. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to some that have been worked on by others. This is the uh, H3K36 demethylase. Um, usually, uh, H3K36 is depleted at CPG islands, uh, and uh, uh, PRC1 is a, is a component of a polycomb complex, which is also uh, recru is recruited by this protein, KDM2B. Uh, this is CFP1, the one we've been talking about. And then there are two other uh, enzymes that put on lysine 4-methylation that also have the yellow CXXC domain, which are also found at CPG islands. So uh, the idea then is that CPG might be the key thing about CPG islands, CPG dinucleotide itself interpreted by these proteins. So we wanted to uh, go a bit further with this, so we've been uh, taking a human back, we've done this in several different ways, this is one of the ways, uh, taking a human a bacterial artificial chromosome, which is a big chunk of DNA, putting in our artificial CPG islands, which we, we just devise with a computer, saying what frequencies we would like. We avoid transcription factors where possible, though that's actually uh, difficult to do. And then um, uh, these are the modifications we look at. Lysine 4 methylation, which is the one I've been talking about so far. We also look for lysine 27 methylation. This is interesting because it's associated with a, a silencing machinery called polycomb, and uh, this, it's essential for polycomb mediated silencing. And uh, the reason why we're interested in that, I hope, will become clear. So that's an active promoter mark, and that's the mark associated with polycomb mediated silencing. And we're going to look at both of those at our integrated site. So we put them into ES cells, and this is a piece of junk, and these are the flanks, and here you're getting the K4 um, trimethylation peaks, and this happens with multiple sequences. Uh, you re reproducibly get something. Uh, these are the controls, SOX2, uh, an active gene, GAPDH, an active gene, uh, and uh, HOXC, which is a bivalent, uh, it has both marks, and M15, which is a silent control. So you also get lysine 27 methylation at this uh, integrated CPG island. It looks rather messy here. Polycomb always looks rather messy. Uh, but if you look at a component of uh, the, uh, the complex that puts on that mark, rather equivalent to uh, CFP1 here, you see uh, a nice discrete peak coinciding with the integrated piece of uh, CPG-rich DNA. So if it looks like a CPG island, even though it's biologically inert, it, is, um, it becomes, uh, uh, it adopts a chromatin structure uh, that resembles real CPG islands. Have we made a gene? This is just a rather long way of saying no. Um, you do not detect any RNA polymerase uh, at this region. So this is, this is the DNA sequence talking to the chromatin and not looking at gene expression at all. Now, bivalent chromatin, you've heard me mention, because it was discovered uh, really by Amanda Fisher's lab and Brad Bernstein's lab uh, simultaneously, and it's a, 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 a chromatin configuration in embryonic stem cells that, um, uh, and other sorts of stem cells where you have both trimethylation of lysine 4 and uh, uh, this repressive, so an active mark and a repressive mark at the same time. And he coined the name uh, bivalent for this. You almost might say ambivalent. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, the way in which it is, uh, was hypothesized to work is this, that these pluripotent stem cells, before they know what to, they're going to become, um, uh, at certain uh, developmentally critical genes, have both marks. And that means that when they differentiate, they can either become depressed uh, or repressed, not necessarily depressed, uh, or uh, active. Uh, and uh, bivalency, therefore, from a recent review, represents a dynamic equilibrium between activation and repression that keeps genes in a plastic-inducible state and at the same time increases robustness. So the conclusion from our initial experiments is that artificial, presumably biologically inert DNA sequences that are GC-rich and CPG-rich, so those are the two properties of CPG islands, form bivalent cr chromatin in ES cells by default. Uh, and that bivalency is therefore not an exclusive property of poised developmental genes, it is simply a direct response uh, of the chromatin to the, uh, 
the DNA sequence. I should mention that bivalent chromatin is something you see when you grow ES cells in serum. If you grow it in other things, which are more conducive to being pluripotent, uh, it goes away. So uh, not totally clear biologically what its function is. So we're nevertheless going to treat bivalency as a property of CPG islands and ask, are CPG richness or GC richness the key to their function? I've told you about these proteins that interact that bind CPG, but that's still really a hypothesis that that is their main function. What is it about CPG islands that, that, that does contribute to their function? So I'm going to sort of go back to basics and ask that question all over again. And this just shows uh, two, a cluster of sequences taken from the random genome, and this is a cluster of sequences uh, that are CPG islands. And uh, what you can see is that the percent GC content, base composition, is the, you get two peaks, and also the CG observed over expected frequency. So this is the, the frequency that you get compared to the frequency you expect. And there again, CPG islands separate. Now you may say these are actually uh, the same thing, but they're not. They're independent variables. You can have a GC-rich sequence uh, with low CPGs and a GC-poor sequence with high CPGs. So you can do this experiment. You can make a high CPG one that has high C G plus C. That's what I've shown you already. Or you can now make the GC content, uh, sorry, CPG frequency very low and nevertheless have lots of Gs and Cs. Or you can have lots of CPGs and a low GC content. And just to show you, that's not a, uh, uh, so that would place you here and here on this graph. So just to show you that that's not a, uh, uh, a sleight of hand, this is a sequence that's 63% GC and has 10 CPGs per 100 base pairs, which is like a normal CPG island. This is 63% GC and has no CPGs per 100 base pairs. And this is, uh, uh, has the same CPG frequency as a CPG island, but it has a uh, much greatly reduced G plus C content, in fact, the same as the bulk genome. So Lizzie Wachter did these experiments. So what happens if you take away all the CPGs? The answer is you lose all of the uh, active, uh, the bivalent chromatin structure. So you have to have CPGs. That fits with what I was saying, telling you before about the proteins that bind there. So that means that what you expect now, if you have lots of CPGs in an AT rich configuration, is that you will get a perfectly good bivalent CPG island. But in fact, you don't. You get uh, absolutely nothing again. So this is a sequence that's full of CPGs. It's just uh, relatively A plus T rich in base composition. And the reason is very simple. Every time you make an AT rich sequence, so it goes from 65% GC down to 40% uh, or even 50% GC, you get reproducible methylation of the insertion. I should mention that for all the other C, all the GC rich CPG islands that you put in, they remain obstinately free of DNA methylation all the time. So they're going into a, a heavily methylated genome, but they're not going getting methylated. But if you make the GC content high, uh, they, they get methylated reproducibly. So uh, what happens if we now take those same constructs and we put them into DNA methylation deficient cells, which have mutations in the enzymes that put on DNA methylation? Now you get bivalency back, you get K4 back, and you get K27 back. So, and you don't have any DNA methylation. So what this means is that if DNA methylation arrives, it trumps everything. Uh, in ES cells, bivalent chromatin is the default state, as I've said, uh, induced by CPG-rich non-transcribed DNA sequences. GC-rich DNA lacking CPGs does not form bivalent chromatin, so CPGs are crucial. CPGs are necessary and sufficient to impose the bivalent chromatin structure, provided DNA methylation is absent. And then the really intriguing finding that we're trying to explain biochemically at the moment, AT-rich, CPG-rich DNA always gets de novo methylated, and this excludes bivalency. So we've got a trigger here for de novo methylation. I should point out that this is an example of DNA sequence determining the epigenome. There is a lot of emphasis on the idea that uh, experience, the environment, disease can affect the epigenome. In this case, and I think in many cases, the DNA sequence is the driving force uh, behind the structure of the epigenome. And um, uh, 
Finally, uh, in answer to the question I posed at the beginning, both GC richness and CPG density influence uh, the epigenome at uh, CPG islands and are necessary for their uh, ability to form this poised chromatin structure. Uh, GC richness keeps out DNA methylation for reasons we don't understand, and CPG density uh, seems to be working by attracting these proteins. So um, methyl CPG, I'll put a P in here now. Um, CG is uh, often referred to as CPG, where the P represents a, a phosphate uh, along the DNA backbone, probably to distinguish it from the CG base pair across the DNA. They're in different motifs, and I showed you this picture early on uh, because it's normal to show the methylated ones and the unmethylated ones interspersed. But actually, they're different signals. Methyl CG binds certain proteins, and non-methyl CG binds or repels different proteins. So they're different sequences, and one should really show them separately. And if you do that, you see CPG islands are even more starkly different from what's in between them, and uh, CPG islands are more or less invisible if you look at just uh, methylated CPG. So now, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to um, discuss um, uh, uh, a protein that uh, binds to methyl CPG, not CG. Uh, and that protein is uh, MECP2. It's a protein that binds to um, uh, methylated DNA. Uh, it, we first identified it in 1992. Uh, and the way we did it was this. You take proteins from uh, nuclei, you run them on a gel, and then you probe with radioactive piece of DNA. And either that DNA is methylated or it's unmethylated. And what you see here is you get binding to a methylated piece of DNA and nothing when the sequence is unmethylated. I could mention that the reason we were doing this experiment, actually, was to try to find what might keep CPG islands free of DNA methylation. Just assumed there was something binding there. So uh, we made some DNA and um, uh, expected to find something binding when it was unmethylated that couldn't bind when it was methylated. And uh, it's in the nature of these things that you sit with this result being disappointed for several weeks before you think, hmm, there might be actually an interesting finding here. It turns out that this is uh, MECP2, as we called it, um, and uh, it binds, there's a methyl group in the major groove on cytosine. There are two of them because of CPG being self-complementary. And this is an X-ray structure of um, the uh, methylated DNA binding domain of MECP2 bound. Um, so we can explain exactly how it gets its ex exquisite uh, uh, specificity for binding only to methylated CG. Uh, I should say that uh, other, uh, another lab has shown how uh, there are structures too also of the CXXC domain showing uh, why it can't bind methylated DNA um, and only binds non-methylated. So um, another reason, so we'd been working on this gene happily because it was binding methylated DNA and therefore potentially might help us understand how DNA methylation works, how uh, this is a potential interpreter of the DNA methylation signal. And so if we could understand how it works, we might learn more about DNA methylation. That was the, the rationale. Uh, but in 1999, the Zogby lab uh, found that uh, this autism spectrum disorder called Rett syndrome is caused almost exclusively by mutations in this gene. Uh, they mapped it genetically to an interval, and there were GABA receptors and various uh, sexy um, neuroscience-type genes in there. And so they were rather disappointed to find that it was this house housekeeping gene. Uh, but for us, it was rather exhilarating because it turned out we'd been working uh, and knew something about a protein uh, that had uh, this uh, clinical relevance. So now... Uh, we had two reasons for studying this. One is to try and understand how DNA methylation works, and the other one uh, was to try to get to the bottom of this disorder. And those two themes are intertwined in what else I'm going to say. So Rett syndrome is predominantly, it predominantly affects girls uh, because the gene's on the X chromosome. And uh, males with these mutations don't survive. So there is no male Rett syndrome. Uh, it, the, 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 the boys don't survive more than two years at the most, and uh, uh, this isn't long enough for it to be, uh, or homogeneous enough in, in uh, manifestation to be uh, called a, uh, a syndrome. Uh, 
So there are other disorders uh, caused by uh, MECP2 mutations. Uh, mild, so these are severe mutations. Um, milder mutations uh, cause X-linked mental retardation. That is, the males now survive, but at the price of, um, um, uh, X, uh, of X-linked mental retardation. And uh, this is associated, these same sort of mutations cause a milder uh, phenotype in females namely a learning disability. Uh, in addition, there, there is, interestingly, an MECP2 gene duplication syndrome, and this has only relatively recently been discovered in the last few years, but it is already clear that this is uh, comparable in frequency to Rett syndrome itself. So, uh, Rett syndrome is an autism spectrum disorder, then, uh, with a monogenic origin, and it's, these are interesting. There are a variety of them: fragile X syndrome, um, tubular sclerosis are the common ones. And now, with exome sequencing being more and more common, there are more and more examples of monogenic um, uh, syndromes, uh, monogenic uh, causes. But uh, uh, these ones, uh, we have the prospect of being able to trace all the way from the mutation to the pathology. We haven't achieved that yet, but that's the aspiration. So it affects one in 15,000 girls, which is comparable with a mutation rate on the, uh, um, uh, of a gene on the X. Uh, period of apparently normal development for six to 18 months, followed by uh, a crisis, uh, during which uh, lots of things are, are lost, really. Uh, if there's any speech, it's lost, um, and uh, walking is quite often lost, very often. Uh, and then they develop uh, the patients develop this uh, ha uh, repetitive hand uh, movement. This is a, just a picture taken from uh, a film movie taken from uh, YouTube, not someone I've ever uh, seen, but it's, uh, it shows you the very characteristic uh, repetitive movements. Also, the breathing, uh, there are breathing abnormalities, breath holding for a very long time, quite distressing uh, for the people looking after them. Uh, but nevertheless, a life expectancy of, um, uh, on average, 40 years now, and it's this sort of going up. Uh, it used to be uh, uh, much closer to 20, uh, but there is absolutely no effective treatment, so that during that time, uh, one requires um, uh, round-the-clock nursing, really. So just to uh, explain the X chromosome inactivation side of things, um, uh, and, and the, uh, the reason uh, for uh, the, uh, the, the chromosomal basis, uh, if you like, one in um, uh, 15,000 sperm in every male uh, has a mutation in the MECP2 gene, and if by chance that's the one that fertilizes the egg, then you end up with a heterozygous uh, uh, female. I emphasize males because 80% of the mutations don't co do come from the father, like in many of such disorders. So you now you have a heterozygous female, and then you have random X chromosome inactivation which means either you inactivate the wild-type gene and you have an, a functionally MECP2 null cell, or you, have, you inactivate the mutant gene and you have a, a functionally normal cell. So you have this mosaicism, interspersion in the brain, in the rest of the body as well, of uh, MECP2 positive and MECP2 negative cells. And that's what rescues, um, that's what allows survival. So just to show you, um, many of us have in our minds the, uh, uh, when you talk about X inactivation, the tortoiseshell cat with these massive black or orange patches on the skin. In the brain, the patches are, are tiny. This is a tip of the dentate gyrus, and these are the nuclei, dappy stained. And this is a heterozygote mouse, it's a piece of the mouse brain, for, for a, a fluorescent version of MECP2. Uh, and what you can see is that there are holes in the pattern. And this is a, a presumably a clone of cells which has inactivated the fluorescent gene, and this is a clone of cells that inactivated the other one. And if you look at the, over, uh, the merge, you can see the contrast between those two. So the point I just want to make here is that the, uh, the mosaicism in the brain is actually quite fine-grained. And so it's not as though you get half a brain with one with, uh, that's expressing the wild type and half that isn't. It's really quite uh, uh, fine-grained. So, the question is, uh, why does, uh, do mutations in the MECP2 gene uh, cause Rett syndrome? Uh, 
And uh, our early work showed that the DNA binding domain, which I showed you the X-ray structure of, is, is in a discrete region of the protein here, methyl CPG binding domain, sometimes called the MBD on some pictures that you'll see. And then we roughly defined a transcription or repression domain. So what was in our mind was that the protein goes to methylated DNA and uh, then somehow uh, leads to transcription or repression via this domain, presumably by recruiting uh, another protein. And, and we were forced to sort of reflect on this because, um, as I'll mention when I, we come to the mouse model, it, it, you, what you would expect is that this, such a protein that is involved in repressing gene expression by recognizing methylated regions and then silencing gene expression, you'd expect when you took it away that you'd get a lot of genes expressed that weren't exp shouldn't be, and that that was the reason for Rett syndrome. But in fact, it didn't turn out to be that simple. Um, uh, some genes go up and some genes go down. It's a, it's a bit of a, uh, a mess. Gene expression does change. And so um, uh, there was a, a sort of big rethink as to whether or not the early work, which suggested that this was a transcription or oppressor, was right or not. So we sort of went back to the drawing board. And the big resource you have for any genetic disease particularly one like this that doesn't run in families, everyone's a new mutation because nobody with these mutations reproduces, is the mutational spectrum. So these are, these are some of the mutations. It's, there are many, many times this number now, uh, but this is an accurate reflection of the distribution. Uh, these are frame shifts up here. Uh, these are nonsense mutations, and these are missense mutations. Now, of course, nonsense and frame shifts, you lose everything downstream, so there's a massive chunk of the protein gone, or variable size chunk of the protein gone. So in a sense, one can ignore them because they're not really surgically pointing you to interesting parts of the protein. But the blue ones, the missense mutations, are because there you've simply put in the wrong amino acid at one site and the rest of the protein is absolutely fine. Yet nevertheless, these people have Rett syndrome. So we, we went into the database, and once a gene is on the beaten track for clinicians to sequence, uh, then every time there's a case that looks as though it might be, then it gets sequenced, and you find loads and loads of polymorphisms. And that means you have to sort out what's a polymorphism and what's a causal uh, disorder. And one way of doing that in, in a disorder like this is to look at the parents. So we looked at all the mutations that were not found in the parents, and uh, we... Uh, we get this sort of map here, and this is, uh, this is the two major clusters. This cluster here, and this cluster here, which it, it, it looks as though there's only a, a few muta uh, different mutations in there, but there's a, a very tight uh, cluster there. And those two clusters account for um, uh, over 20% uh, of the mutations uh, causing Rett syndrome. I, I mean, I actually two mutations in uh, no, one each in the, one of those clusters account for 20 percent. So, um, the que it's pretty clear that this is the uh, methylated DNA binding domain and most of these mutations actually uh, inactivate the DNA binding. Uh, but we didn't know what this was. But interestingly enough now, you, in addition when you look at your disease mutations, you can also look at the uh, exome variant server, which is from 6,000 uh, normal volunteers. And these are mutations with no clinical effect. Uh, and because these individuals, one doesn't know clinically the status of these people because they're uh, anonymized, of course, but one has to assume, since they volunteered for this program, that they, they, they are not severely afflicted. Uh, and what you see is a, a sort of a, um, the reciprocal of the uh, mutation pattern that causes Rett syndrome. In other words, there's a gap here uh, where these mutations are, and there's another gap here where you get uh, the DNA binding domain. There are just, there's just less data at the end terminus uh, in, in the database. So there's a nice reciprocality here. It suggests that there are two critical regions uh, where, within the MECP2 protein that must be intact. I can answer questions about this or this, um, later if you want, uh, though the bottom line is we are investigating making mouse models of these, but we do not exactly know what's gone wrong there. We hypothesize this one might destabilize the protein, but we don't know. So, um, uh, let's talk first of all about this domain. I've told you it's the DNA binding domain. I've shown you the structure of it. 
in the rethink that uh, followed the gene expression studies, it was questioned whether or not MECP2 really was a methylated DNA binding protein. And I think now there are a lot of strands of evidence that say it is. Uh, one of them I'm showing you is this, which is, comes from our lab. This is, the, uh, this is a, 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 an immunoprecipitation experiment where we immunoprecipitate MECP2 with an antibody after cross-linking it to the chromatin, a chip uh, experiment. And um, we did it for the EXIST promoter. Um, we chose the EXIST gene promoter, a gene involved in exit activation, because we expected half of it to be unmethylated, that's the open circles, and half of it to be methylated. And indeed, in our input, that's what we found. Then we immunoprecipitated with an antibody against MECP2, and we found we pulled down strongly preferentially the methylated one. So this is from brain, where the protein is extremely abundant. There's uh, 20 million molecules per nucleus in the brain, so it's astonishingly abundant. It's nearly as abundant as nucleosomes. Uh, so even though, so, though it's incredibly abundant, you nevertheless, it, it was binding to the methylated one. And this is just a, a, a mark that's associated with active uh, transcription, and it pulls down the opposite one. So, this is the sort of evidence, but there's a lot more. And importantly, if we take, and I'm not, I, for reasons of time, I'm not going to go into this, if you specifically deplete DNA methylation in the brain by making a mutation in the DNA methyltransferase that leads to loss of methylation in the brain, this is not good for the, the brain, I should tell you, but in the, uh, in the time um, you have available, you can show that MECP2 does not bind anymore to the chromosomes. So uh, this is pretty clear. DNA methylation is required for efficient MECP2 binding to chromatin, but this is biology, so there are complications. Uh, one is that methyl CG is not the only methylated sequence in the brain genome. It turns out that alone among um, the tissue, I mean, there are some in, e in uh, embryonic stem cells, but in most somatic cells, you only have methyl CG, but in the brain, there is also methyl CA, which is, of course, not a symmetrical sequence. There's a T on the other strand here. And this has recently been reported to bind MECP2 as well. And this uh, is being investigated by uh, a, a number of labs, including ours. The second point, as I mentioned at the beginning, is methyl CG can be oxidized by TET enzymes to give hydroxymethyl C. So there's a, just an oxidized form of this methyl group. And here, uh, although there was a, a very um, interesting and... Uh, and uh, high-profile paper in, in cell saying that MECP2 binds to hydroxymethyl C. There is also a uh, uh, less lauded paper uh, published in uh, nucleic acids research um, uh, uh, a decade earlier, uh, on which, which I happen to know well because I'm a co-author on it. Um, so uh, there may be some special pleading here, but I don't think so. It's showing that MECP2 does not bind to hydroxymethyl CG. So uh, there is at the moment a conflict between these two sets of data and uh, a lot of work is also going on there. I'd like to be able to give you the bottom line. I personally think that it does not bind to hydroxymethyl CG, but uh, I'm conflicted by my own authorship of my own paper. Uh, and um, if one can be so conflicted, actually I'm not the senior author, it's, um, but I trust the data implicitly and we've also reproduced it. Uh, and this, I think, is, a, is an interesting area, but I don't think it... It, it alters the fact that uh, DNA methylation is the primary uh, targeting influence on uh, MECP2. And then the second um, uh, region, uh, this, is, uh, this is another way, uh, this is, these are these mutations again, uh, and um, this is the second region uh, that uh, we find mutations, and nothing was known about this. So it turns out that this is a... Um, We've called it the NCORE interaction domain because Matt List uh, hypothesized that it was a um, DNA binding domain. Uh, sorry, a protein, I'm just rubbish, a protein interaction domain. And so he went searching for proteins. We'd done this several times before, so had other people. But we, this time we did it more sensibly uh, because Matt was doing it uh, and uh, made a number of changes. And now we identified a series of proteins, ME2CP2 itself, of course. We're pulling it down now with an antibody. Uh, KPNA4 and KPNA3, these are the importins. They bind to the nuclear localization signal, take it into the nucleus, fine. And then, uh, then these things, these five proteins here. And these five proteins are all subunits of a well-known 
transcriptional repression complex. And this is called, rejoices in the two names, NCOR and SMART. Uh, that just means those proteins were discovered by different labs. Actually, NCOR is extremely similar to SMART. They're both gigantic proteins upon which are hung uh, in a um, uh, um, very ordered manner uh, TBL1 and TBLR1, and this histone deacetylase, uh, histone deacetylase 3. Now, just to clarify for you, this, this protein is well known because it's associated with quite a lot of uh, unliganded nuclear receptors. And so, uh, normally, a receptor will uh, bind to DNA, it will bring in this and then it will uh, cause the deacetylase, uh, histone deacetylase will take acetylation, which is a mark of gene activity, and uh, remove it. So uh, in case you missed that piece of PowerPoint uh, expertise, it's, uh, that's it there, gone. So um, uh, deacetylation is a classical uh, way in which uh, genes are silenced, uh, because acetylation is inextricably linked to gene activity. So now we have MECP2 recruiting this thing, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, has a number of consequences. So let me just uh, point out, first of all, that MECP2 binds this. That doesn't, we, actually, we thought when we, when we got it, I'll bet you that's disrupted by those mutations in the second cluster, and indeed it is. So if you immunoprecipitate MECP2, uh, you pull down MEC, uh, TBLR1, you pull down histone deacetylase 3, uh, but if you have any of those point mutations uh, that cause Rett syndrome, you lose the interaction with the co-repressor. Mm -hmm. And we've mapped it quite carefully, and there is a, a region of less than 10 amino acids that interacts with NCOR. And mutations that, in there, um, that, um, that destroy that interaction all cause uh, Rett syndrome. They do something else, those mutations, if you do, if you, uh, this is just a transcriptional repression assay uh, where you transfect a, a reporter gene into cells and then tether MECP2 to it. Uh, this is fold repression. Wild type protein represses very well. P225R, um, which is a mutation somewhere else in the protein, represses very well. But all of the mutations, the missense mutations that cause Rett syndrome, no longer repress. And interestingly, if you treat with an inhibitor of DNA, uh, of, uh, of histone deacetylases, like the one that is in NCOR, SMART, then you lose the repression. So um, transcription repression depends on the histone deacetylase activity, and it utterly depends on the ability to interact with NCOR. So we made a mouse uh, with Mike Greenberg's lab. We've made it in our lab. He's made it in his lab. Uh, we collaborate. Uh, and he has a... Um, uh, we have an, an R306C uh, knock-in mouse. R306C is one of the missense mutations in that second cluster. It destroys the interaction with NCOR in vitro, and it causes Rett syndrome in human. There are more than 200 cases. Uh, so uh, if you put it into mice, you get this hind limb clasping, which is characteristic of Rett syndrome. You get the reduced survival. You get... Uh, um, this is a rotor rod performance. Put it on a rotating rod, see how long it takes to fall off if you gradually accelerate the rod. And this is uh, wild type animals, and this is the mutant animals. They're not very good at it, and uh, their brains also weigh less. Um, uh, uh, the animals themselves weigh similar amounts, but their brains weigh less. And there are a number of other features. So, this we've made the model in the mouse, and uh, uh, this also causes Rett syndrome in that system. So um, the model we have now for the way MECP2 works is that uh, this cluster of here, mutations here, stops proper binding to, to methylated DNA, and this cluster of mutations here can't interact with the NCOR smart co-repressor. So we have this sort of bridging image in our minds uh, where MECP2 is bridging between the methylated DNA and the co-repressor. This is one and a half megadaltons, this, pro this complex. Uh, this is only 50 um, kilodaltons. So the scales are not accurate here. Uh, and then um, in the case of uh, T158M, which is the most 10% of Rett syndrome mutations, a mutation in here, uh, you can't bind DNA anymore. And in the case of uh, R306C, 
you can't bind uh, NCOR. So either end of the bridge you break, you cause Rett syndrome. So that's fine. Then you come to the thorny issue of what transcription does MECP2 repress? And here we're, uh, we're making progress, but we are by no means there. We know when you take away MECP2, histone acetylation is up in the brain. You've taken away a histone deacetylase, so you can't remove acetylation, so you end up with more. Fine. The epigeno, uh, histone H1, uh, the histone you don't usually hear very much about, uh, is, is, is increased. Uh, and the epigenome is disorganized in this sense. Uh, expression of some genes is up and others is down, though. It's still true. Uh, and these effects are quite small. So we don't have the nice explosion of gene expression that we were after. So what are the possibilities? We can be controlling transcription of specific genes through this repressor recruitment. We can control transcription in response to neuronal activity. Um, this, the, the MECP2 is a phosphoprotein. When neurons fire, it becomes phosphorylated on specific sites. Mike Greenberg has studied this, has pioneered this whole area. Uh, and, uh, you know, this could be uh, a significant part of the story. Uh, and, uh, or you could have something boring like dampening transcription or noise. This protein is abundant enough to bind throughout the genome. If you do chip, you don't see nice little peaks like transcription factors. You see a horrible sort of mess. It goes up where there's more methylation, down where there's less. So it's a kind of C of MECP2 binding. So could it be a dampening noise? And this is a nice experiment to illustrate that sort of thing. Um, it's from Fred Gage's lab. And he has a transposon, uh, which he in integ integrates into the genome. And it does not fluoresce unless it moves. But if it moves, then it starts to fluoresce. So every time you see a fluorescent cell, it means there's been a move in that cell. And here's what you get in a wild-type cell, a handful of uh, wild-type brain, a handful of, of um, transpositions. You get a lot more uh, of the order of uh, an order of magnitude more in MECP2 null, suggesting that um, uh, the, 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 the transcriptional dribble from the uh, transposons is no longer as efficiently repressed. I should point out that this is not the cause of the disease. The number, although it looks impressive, the number of cells affected here is trivially small as a fraction of the whole brain. Uh, and something else I'm going to tell you later argues that uh, it's not, uh, the mutations are not causative in Rett syndrome. So uh, the bottom line when we come to this rather, uh, bottom of this rather busy slide is that we don't actually have the foggiest idea at the moment uh, about gene expression. But I think there is progress uh, on the horizon, and there's quite a lot of work going on, including in our lab, to try to get a system where you can s properly uh, answer this question. Meanwhile, there are people, uh, prominent uh, researchers, who are not convinced that MECP2 is a repressor. They think it might be an activator. So I should, I'm telling you that just to point out that uh, the arguments I've given you are uh, do not, until you know this, the answer to this bit, uh, I think it's, it's, it's going to be, to a certain extent, up in the air. So now, uh, what I've been telling you about is mutations in MECP2 and the molecular biology and uh, trying to work our way up uh, to um, establish the pathway from the mutation to the pathology. The other way of doing that is to come down from the pathology and the mouse model uh, and try and meet yourself coming the other way, so to speak. And I'm going to finish up with some uh, experiments on, in this way that I think bear on both the disorder and also uh, the mechanism underlying the disorder. So um, the, the question I want to address is reverse, concerns reversibility. Rett syndrome is not a uh, neurodegenerative disorder. It's not like Alzheimer's or Huntington's or Parkinson's disease where neurons actually die. It's just a simplification of the neurons. Um, no cell death in patients. All the mouse model has been detected. Uh, and neurons are small and somewhat simplified. They don't have such complex uh, processes, um, at least in certain regions of the brain. And this is something you have to do statistically. So uh, the question therefore arises, if you put back the protein, uh, can you sort of reinflate these cells and, and, and uh, make them uh, OK? And um, if you're a biochemist, you tend to think, Yes, because it's a, it's a machine with a bit missing, and if you put the bit back, everything will be OK. Uh, but if you're a neuroscientist, you tend to review, view the brain far more in a historical way. 
and uh, uh, with critical periods and things that if you go through without the full complement of uh, gizmos, then you, you end up scarred and that can never be gone through again. So those are two sort of different views. And I have to say the second view predominated at the time we did these experiments. We, uh, blithely ignorant of that, uh, made the uh, MECP2 gene. Um, uh, we integrated a stop cassette in the middle of the gene uh, that would stop, uh, would bring transcription to a, a grinding halt. And then um, on either side of this were LOX-P sites, which meant we could remove that whenever we wanted to and uh, restart transcription. And so um, the person who did these uh, experiments is Jackie Guy. Um, so a normal mouse uh, lives in the green and pleasant land for um, over a year, two years, something like that. But an MECP2 null mouse, the males, so this is not really the model of Rett syndrome, uh, MECP2 minus males, which die prematurely in, in humans, die prematurely also in mice uh, at roughly 12 weeks of age. And so our plan is, was to inject with tamoxifen, which uh, causes the deletion of the stop cassette through an indirect mechanism, to delete the, um, the stop cassette in the area where death is occurring. So these are symptomatic animals. We're not interested in preventing the onset of the symptoms. We want to actually reverse them after they've already started. So this is... Um, uh, uh, an animal on the day it received the um, mutation, sorry, the uh, tamoxifen injection. Uh, it shows the phenotype that we, uh, the, 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 the mice get uh, when they're feeling rather unwell. It's very low to the ground. It uh, doesn't move. Uh, it's got a tremor. Uh, the flank, if you can see, is moving non-rhythmically. They get the apneas, which is also seen in the, in the patients. In fact, this is mo what mostly they die of. Uh, because they become hypoxic, and they also have the hind limb uh, clasping. Um, and then this is, the, this is the same mouse, just to illustrate better than uh, I can do with, with words, uh, a month later. So this, this mouse would have not lasted more than two weeks at the most. Uh, and this is a month later, and it uh, went on to live for over a year before donating its life uh, to science. So um, this... Uh, <laughs> This is a, it's a, I should point out, people sometimes say, it wasn't the same mouse, it had a different ear marking, but actually it is, this, it is the same mouse. And, and this is now, these mice are available at the at Jackson Labs and it's been reproduced uh, many times. And uh, so leaving you with the unedifying picture of a mouse uh, <laughs> not hind, uh, clasping its hind limbs. Uh, so the, the point is really that um, uh, we're getting prominent reversal. Now, um, this uh, is done with MECP2 minus males, uh, which are relatively young at the time you do the reversal, whereas the females, I'll show you the female phenotype, the female mice are perfectly normal and we can breed from them uh, up to 10 litters you can get during this time when they're sexually mature, and then they suddenly hit a wall and um, they develop these chronic neurological phenotypes, and, uh, but they nevertheless live for a normal lifespan. So this is also reminiscent of real Rett syndrome in humans where there is a, um, uh, a transition uh, to uh, chronic uh, neurological symptoms. Uh, and um, so these animals are not only old uh, for a mouse, but also they are uh, the real model for Rett syndrome. So, so we wanted to see whether or not we could reverse those, and I'll just show you uh, that. So that's a reversed mouse, and that's a wild-type uh, mouse. These are the females, and that's a mouse that, at the bottom that couldn't respond because it doesn't, it's not genetically able to. And you can see that really the, the reversed mouse is indistinguishable. That's what the, originally the mouse looked like, uh, the, the obese one. The, on this background, they become obese and lose that with... Uh, uh, when, when, the, the, when the reversal's going on, which takes about uh, a month, month to a month and a half for their weight to come down and all the other phenotypes to, to change. So uh, the implications of reversibility are that Rett syndrome is potentially, obviously therapeutically, a potentially a curable condition. This is a proof of principle that, uh, in fact, um, it might be curable in humans. Rett syndrome is not strictly a neurodevelopmental disorder. Now, these disorders are, are traditionally referred to as neurodevelopmental, 
And there are two possible meanings for neurodevelopmental. One is that they start early, um, and that's still true. And the other one, which I think is underlying many uses of the word neurodevelopmental, that it's due to a defect in development. And we've put back the protein when development has finished ages ago. So uh, in that sense, uh, Rett syndrome doesn't seem like a neurodevelopmental disorder. This might apply to other neurodevelopmental disorders also. And actually, we now know that you know, there are clinical trials for fragile X syndrome. Uh, and uh, there's, there's certainly a genetic reversal is possible in, in that. Uh, uh, and one wonders how many of the disorders that we instinctively regard as untreatable uh, are not. And uh, in fact, mechanistically, it suggests that the function of this protein is actually maintenance and stability rather than development. That it, neurons are gigantic cells. They spend ages after they're born sorting out who they're going to be partnered with. A lot of them fail that test and, get, and then die. And then once you've made all those decisions, the guess is that maintaining that information is, is a high priority. And I, I suspect that MECP2 is one of the proteins that ensures that. So finally, in my talk, prospects for therapy. Uh, reactivate the silent MECP2 gene on the inactive X. Remember, why do gene therapy? There's already another gene in there. These are heterozygous females. They just happen to have shut it down on the inactive X. But such is our knowledge of epigenetics that we can't go in and suddenly reverse it and say, OK, now express that gene. Uh, gene therapy, which is I'm going to say a little bit about. Gene editing. Um, this is obviously the ultimate end point of uh, the genomics revolution. You have to be able to go in and rewrite. Uh, we can't, haven't got there yet, but the you know, CRISPR and things, and son, daughter, and bride of CRISPR uh, will uh, hopefully take us there. Uh, read through of nonsense mutations. Bone marrow transplantation. There was a paper in Nature uh, saying that if you take the bone marrow from a a uh, normal mouse and put it into a, a mouse that um, is uh, affected by um, MECP2 deficiency and showing the phenotype that you, you ameliorate, not, not showing the phenotype yet, you delay the onset of the phenotype. Uh, I know of three labs that have tried to reproduce this without success. So this is most important because the parents line up their kids for bone marrow transplantation, which is a non-trivial procedure. Uh, and it's therefore very important that uh, contrary views, if they are right, get published. And then the conventional approach of taking antagonists and uh, antagonists and antagonists of downstream targets of MECP2. But as I say, we're having trouble finding those. So just gene therapy, this is what we've been doing. Uh, we formed an alliance with Gail Mandel, uh, a collaboration, and she has uh, really driven this collaboration, I have to say, uh, from her lab in Oregon. Uh, she, uh, uh, um, Brian Casper, made virus uh, for us, uh, and uh, he put in the MECP2 promoter, the MECP2 gene. In my lab, Ellen Schwal uh, was doing direct injection of this virus into the brain of affected mice. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm not showing you that is that it did not end particularly happily. Um, but uh, uh, Gail put it into the tailbane, which you may think is a rather odd thing to do with a virus that you want to go to the brain. In fact, this virus crosses the blood-brain barrier rather inefficiently, but it does so. And uh, uh, what she found was that this led to a, a, a really quite striking improvement in these mice. So uh, here we have three different trials on a rotor rod, day one, day two, day three. Uh, they're supposed to get better. The wild-type ones get somewhat better. Uh, the mutant ones don't. And you can see the purple ones that have been treated with the uh, a virus show a, an intermediate effect. Turn the cage lid upside down and uh, see how long they take to fall off. The red one, the mutants fall off quickly, the wild types less quickly, and you've got an improvement there. Uh, this is balancing on top of uh, two cylinders. And uh, again, uh, you're seeing the same intermediate purple result for the treated animals. And finally, you put a load of nesting into the, ne into the cage which you have weighed, and you come back the next day and see how much of that nesting they've used to make a nest. And the answer is not much if they're a mutant, uh, a lot if they're a wild type. And again, you're seeing an improvement. So there is a, an effect of this uh, virus, which I'll just finally illustrate. This is not the same mouse, but you can see this is a, to show you for the first time a female uh, with the Rett syndrome like uh, phenotype, if you think back to the human condition, um, which I showed you earlier. 
And then this is a, a, another, an animal that was treated uh, with the virus. It's not such a good experiment as the one I showed you before because it's not the same mouse. But nevertheless, uh, there does seem to be a robust improvement. So, Rett syndrome could be the first curable autism spectrum disorder. Uh, there's a lot of scientific excitement, the brain, epigenetics, it's got all the right ingredients to encourage scientists to get stuck in. Uh, it's uh, rapidly advancing at the moment, there are lots of papers coming out uh, about it, and uh, there's proof of principle that Rett syndrome is reversible. So, um, uh, one would love to think uh, during one's lifetime <laughs> that uh, one would see uh, clinical improvements because so far one has delivered hope but not actually any practical uh, improvement. So just to go back to the beginning then, on the final slide, uh, we've been talking about proteins that bind to non-methylated CG and can't bind methylated CG and these uh, create, if you like, a sunny uh, environment around them which is transcription friendly, the H3K4 methylation, though actually there's a kind of a rainbow around it which is the, the polycomb uh, to do with bivalency. And then uh, you, this other class of proteins that can't bind this, that can bind this and create a sort of uh, Edinburgh in January uh, <laughs> kind of uh, in, environment which is hostile to, um, to um, gene expression only. So, um, uh, obviously, though that sort of cartoon doesn't do justice to the detail, and I think uh, the, the detail is where, uh, is where we need to be. So, uh, uh, the people who've done this work, uh, uh, Lizzie Wachter did the CPG Island stuff, um, and, and Matt List did the uh, MECP2 uh, immunoprecipitation, Hélène Cheval is not on the picture, um, our collaborators at Harvard Medical School, Mike Greenberg and Dan Ebert, Gail Mandel and Saurabh Garg, Brian Casper made the virus and Stuart Cobb is um, our neuroscience advisor who tries vainly to teach uh, my lab and me neuroscience. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure Adrian will be happy to take some questions. Michael. Hi, very nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding the gene therapy aspect. Did I um, remember, or do I remember correctly, that in the beginning you said that um, there's a gene duplication which also is symptomatic? Yes. Would so that you, make gene therapy a bit complex? You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are several reasons why that sort of therapy is, is, is never, you know, is, is a long way from being usable. One is that, in fact, people said don't bother because um, you're going to put in too much MECP2 and you, you won't be able to control it. And indeed, our injections into the brain, what it taught us was you can hit most of the cells in the brain with these viruses, which is a, a useful thing to know if you're going to do something more sophisticated like editing. But uh, we couldn't control the dose and the result was toxicity. So it's, in a way, it's surprising that the peripheral injection worked as well as it did. And it's not quite clear why it did. But you're right. I, I think the, the, the future for simple, unadorned gene therapy is limited. Yeah, especially if you take AV9 and inject it uh, into the periphery, you do get a brain transduction, but it's sort of body transduction. So I'm, I'm a bit surprised that you get a global effect. Yeah, well, if you look for MECP2 expression, and that's obviously your assay, it's quite sensitive. You can see it throughout the brain. So it's getting across, but I mean, one of the problems would be, A, 10% of um, humans have antibodies against those viruses, and the dose you'd need to put in would be something like 10 to the 17 virus, virus particles. I think immunologically this would be uh, disastrous. So there are a number of things wrong, which I should have stressed. This is not, uh, oh, next stop the clinic by any means. Over here. Hi, I have two quick questions. One question is, can we exclude that other, rather than transcription uh, is something that is a, uh, affected by MCP2, like, I don't know, other DNA metabolism stuff, like No, you, you, can't, you, can't, or... exclude, you can't exclude anything. The only thing I can say is that the, you know, the, the, the search for associated proteins was, um, 
you know, hypothesis-free in a sense, and it pulled out a well-known co-repressor that's not known for doing anything other than repressing. And the two clusters of mutations can be accounted for by the failure to recruit that co-repressor or the failure to bind DNA. So if there were other regions of the protein that were important for other interactions, uh, you would expect those to be seen. Now you could say that bit of the, D of the protein binds NCOR, but actually it does something else that you don't know about, uh, and that's what's important for avoiding Rett syndrome. If you were to say that, I would say I, I think that's relatively unlikely, but actually we can't exclude it. Just quickly, do anyone just try to, to uh, like use the IPS and try to, to differentiate them in so the, from uh, patients? Alison Watry has derived IPS cells from patients and um, has different, as you know, the problem with IPS cells is, is that they're genetically heterogeneous. So, um, uh, but they, he, has, he has found, uh, this is in Fred Gage's lab, he has found um, defects in differentiation of neurons from those cells. So that is a valid system. And um, recently, uh, Rudolf Janisch has taken human um, iPS cells and has done genetics on them so that he's actually taken the same line and he's knocked out MECP2. And he also finds, excuse me, quite a strong phenotype in vitro. So I think you're right, that could be a system uh, to develop in the future. We're actually doing that only with mouse uh, cells at the moment. Okay, Alka. Um, do you think that uh, DNA methylation per se indicates a chromatin that is repressed? Or do you think that there can be different stages of methylation of the cytosine that can leave it in a, an active state as well? Well, I think it can be active because the bulk of the genome is methylated. So apart from the CPG islands, which are non-methylated and surround the promoters of most genes, not all genes, the rest of the gene is, uh, you know, gene bodies are quite densely methylated. Uh, and there are regions like the globin gene that are activated even though the whole region's methylated. But you've got to remember that in the bulk genome, a, methyl C a CPG occurs once every 100 to 150 base pairs. So they're really miles apart. Uh, and the low density methylation of that kind, if you put it near a, an artificial promoter, unless the promo if the promoter is extremely weak, it will shut it down. But if it's, a, if it's a halfway respectable promoter, it has absolutely no effect. Whereas if you take dense methylation at a CPG island, even strong promoters are shut down by that. So the answer is it's quite subtle. It depends on the local density, how repressive it is. Okay, then one more question. Um, you've, hi. You've alluded to the fact that uh, the development seems to be normal and then there is a time point during the development or the life of the, that uh, you hit a wall, you've defined it as hitting a wall. And, and that suddenly the demethylation starts happening very frequently and has yes. that been related to anything else, infections well, or...? Well, you would, you would expect the primary effects, if they're on gene expression, that you would see them before the symptoms appear. The actual relationship between, um, you know, the, this is where it's so infuriating. We don't know what the primary effect is. We do see changes in gene expression. You do see them prior to the onset of the symptoms, but we can't point to which ones we think are the most important. I mean, the most mysterious is the females, the female mice, which are, have been behaving perfectly normally. And if you do LTP, you know, measure, LTP on the, in the hippocampus, it's completely normal. Then suddenly, at the age of six months, which is a ripe old age for these mice, they suddenly develop all these symptoms. It feels like a threshold. Uh, maybe it could be that numbers of neurons that are non-functional are gradually going up. So if I, if I had to give a, a crude analogy, I'd say that maybe the half-life, the use, the fully functional half-life of a neuron in the absence of MECP2 is reduced. And that when a certain number of them cross that threshold, the brain enters a, uh, um, a different stage where it just simply doesn't work so well. But why that should be so sudden rather than being uh, uh, very gradual, I really have no explanation for. And is the same in all of the mice? Well, what do you mean by the same? In all so is it oh, yes, it's six fully months penetrant. and two days and 30 minutes? Oh, no, no, they don't <laughs> synchronously, no. <but> for, <laughs> 
for the females, it's between four and 12 months. So it's actually very variable between mice, even on an inbred background. But of course, the patterns of uh, um, methylation in the brain may be different in these different mice. It will be because of chance uh, X inactivation. So that's a variable that one could do without, but is nevertheless there. The males are really quite synchronous. OK, so um, before we retire to the um, foyer for a drink, um, it remains for um, Professor Malim to uh, present Adrian with his gift. Adrian, thank you very much for an absolutely wonderful seminar, just illustrating so beautifully how basic science investigations, cell biology and molecular genetics can feed into, into very important clinical questions and how that can then drive the next round of investigation, so on and so forth. It was a, a real pleasure to listen to that seminar. Um, we've got a full, small uh, set of gifts for you here. Uh, thank you very, very much. much. Thanks. And um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And <laughs> can I get in there? Do I have to open it? And then uh, just to like to uh, welcome all of you to share a drink with uh, Adrian outside uh, for the, um, there's a reception. Thank you very much for your attention.